So greetings from my side. I am Dr. Vivek Kumar Sharma, Dean, Professor and Head, Department of Physiology, Government Institute of Medical Sciences, Greater Noida, UP. So today we are going to have the lecture on the physiology of endocrine pancreas. So the specific learning objectives of this lecture are that by the end of this chapter, we should be able to understand the synthesis and storage of insulin hormone mechanism of molecular and the cellular events in insulin secretion, regulation and functions of insulin, counter-regulatory hormones, applied part that is diabetes mellitus. So coming to the introduction to pancreas, this is pancreas organ and it is a gland with both exocrine and as well as the endocrine function. So it is roughly 6 to 10 inches and 60 to 100 grams and it is located retroperitoneally at the level of L2. Coming to the parts of pancreas, it has following parts. It has a head, it has a neck, it has a body and then it has a tail. So exocrine pancreas is roughly 80% by volume. Endocrine pancreas is roughly 2% by volume and it consists of islet of Langerhans. We have roughly around 1 to 2 million islets and the size of the islet is roughly 76 into 175 microns and they are more located in the tail region and they have a copious blood supply as well. So uh, the blood from the islet of Langerhans drains into the hepatic portal vein and from there it goes to the rest of the GIT. So we see over here that the islets are more densely located in the tail region and within the islet the cells arrangement is, is such that the B cells that secrete the insulin hormone they are near the center of this islet then we have A cells that are there slightly outer to it and pancreatic polypeptide secreting cells they are sparsely distributed everywhere and D cells that secrete somatostatin, they are located towards the periphery of the islets. Alpha cells that secrete the glucagon hormone, they are roughly 20%. Then we have the beta cells that secrete insulin 60 to 65%. And there is also the equimolar synthesis and secretion of C peptide. And there is also secretion of substance amylin. D cells, they will secrete the uh, hormone somatostatin and F cells, they will secrete the pancreatic polypeptide. So we see that beta cells, they are roughly 60 to 65% and they are the most common cells present in the islet cells. Now these are all are the polypeptides and they have the hormonal activity. Insulin and glucagon uh, they are involved in the regulation of the intermediary metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Somatostatin, that is inhibitory hormone, it is involved in the regulation of the islet cell secretion and the pancreatic polypeptide is involved in the GI function, its exact function is still unknown. So, how do they perform the function? We have two major hormones being released by endocrine pancreas. One is insulin, another is glucagon. And they are counter-regulatory in, in nature to each other. On one hand, insulin is anabolic that helps in the storage of glucose, fatty acids and amino acids. And, glu and glucagon on the other hand is catabolic in nature. It mobilizes the glucose, fatty acids and the amino acids into bloodstream causing an increase in the blood glucose level and insulin will cause a decrease in the blood glucose level. So there is a homeostasis maintained by the fine regulation of insulin and glucagon where somatostatin comes to play as its role within the pancreas itself. So insulin is an anti-diabetogenic hormone that is it causes a decrease in the blood glucose level. It also enhances the growth. It uh, the excess of the insulin leads to the hypoglycemia that is decrease in the blood glucose level beyond normal that might lead to the coma and convulsions and the deficiency of insulin diabetes mellitus 
will lead to the persistent elevated blood glucose level that is one of the most common endocrine disorder worldwide glucagon glucagon is the diabetogenic hormone it causes an increase in the blood glucose level and its deficiency will cause the hypoglycemia whereas the excess of glucagon is also involved in the pathophysiology of diabetes somatostatin somatostatin will inhibit the release of both these two hormones glucagon and insulin and it also decreases the gi motility secretion and absorption and uh, pancreatic polypeptide its exact role in the metabolism of the nutrients is uncertain but it plays a role in the git regulation now let's talk about the insulin hormone what is its structure how it is synthesized and what are its functions discovery of the insulin hormone was done in 1921 by two scientists frederick grant brand benting and john macleod for which they were awarded in 1923 nobel prize in physiology or medicine and they are credited for, for being the discoverer of the insulin and also its therapeutic potential in the patient management now let's see the structure of the insulin hormone it is a polypeptide that contains 51 amino acids and these are linked by the disulfide bridges we have three disulfide bridge within a chain we have the intra chain we can see here one disulfide bridge and we have two between the a chain and the b chain we have two disulfide bridges this a chain is connected by this connecting peptide to this b chain so the total molecular weight is 6000 the alpha chain or a chain is 21 amino acids then we have this c peptide the connecting chain and the beta chain is 30 amino acids so these are linked by the disulfide bridges coming to the synthesis insulin is like any other protein polypeptide hormone is synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum of the b cells of the pancreas then thereafter it is transported to the golgi apparatus where it is packaged in the membrane ground membrane bound granules and secreted outside into the blood so the granules will move to the plasma membrane and the exocytosis will cause the release of this hormone so it will be synthesized in endoplasmic reticulum as the pre pro insulin and then from there pro insulin is formed and in the golgi apparatus it gets converted into the uh, into insulin which is roughly 90 to 97% and there is equimolar presence of c peptide hormone as well and it also causes the release of amylin so the important thing is that uh, c peptide is being measured by the radio amino assay that can be used as an index of b cell function in patients who are receiving exogenous insulin therapy so pc peptide has its own role in the management of the patients of diabetes mellitus amylin amylin is it inhibits the glucagon secretion it delays the gastric emptying and it acts as a satiety agent and nowadays this amylin analogs are being used for the diabetes management coming to another group of substances called as insulin like substances which we will be talking more in growth hormone secretion and growth hormone uh, uh, functions so this insulin like substances are present in the plasma in addition to the insulin hormone and they are called as the non suppressible insulin like activity or ncla that means even when the pancreatectomy is done the insulin activity will go on and that is why it is called as non suppressible insulin like activity and they primarily comprise of igf1 and igf2 that is insulin like growth factor 1 and insulin like growth factor 2 igf1 is primarily secreted by the liver and it mediates the action of growth hormone so another question then comes why pancreatectomy causes diabetes mellitus when we have these substances uh, ancilla and they cannot take up the insulin function it is so because the insulin like activities of igf1 
and IGF-2 primarily plays role during the intrauterine life. They are very weak as compared to that of the insulin. So they can supplement or they can support the function of insulin, but they cannot replace it. Now coming to the insulin metabolism, once the insulin binds with its receptor and has already mediated its action, it gets internalized in proteases in the endosomes and it gets destroyed over here within the endosomes. So T half of insulin is very less, just 5 minutes. So once the action is over, so it will be, and it will be endocytosed and then it will be destroyed intracellularly. Coming to the transporters, how this glucose enters the cells? We have seven different types of the transporters. They all function by the, the physiology of facilitated diffusion. And all these transporters, they cross the membrane 12 times. So they are also called as 12 pass transporters. So they, will, they consist of GLUT1 that is involved in the baseline glucose uptake in the placenta, RBC, brain, colon, kidney, etc. Whereas GLUT2 is the glucose sensor in the beta cells. GLUT3 also functions like GLUT1. GLUT4 is a special type of the transporters which is insulin which helps in the insulin mediated glucose uptake in the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle and the adipose tissue. Then we have GLUT5 that is involved in the fructose transport in the jejunum and sperm. GLUT6 is a pseudogene and GLUT7 is transporter of glucose 6-phosphate into the endoplasmic reticulum. So, liver and B cell glucose sensors are GLUT2. Skeletal and cardiac muscle and adipose tissue transporter are GLUT4. And there is another group of the transporters which are called as SGLT1 and SGLT2. Respectively, it means sodium glucose co-transport 1 and sodium glucose co-transport 2. They are present in both the gastrointestinal tract and kidney and they will cause an increase in the absorption of the glucose along with the sodium and they function by the secondary active transport. So what are insulin independent cells within the body? Although all the tissues of the body are dependent on insulin, but we have few organs or the cells which are which can function even in the absence of insulin. They, they are brain, red blood cells, WBCs, renal tubular cells, retina, Schwann cells of neuron, placenta and importantly liver as well. So now let's see what are the principal actions of insulin. We can subdivide the actions of insulin into the rapid action that occurs within seconds, intermediate actions that take place within minutes and the long term actions that take around a few hours. So the rapid action that take place in seconds, they usually primarily consist of when the insulin hormone comes and it binds with the receptors onto the cell membrane, that this immediately causes the changes in such a manner that the metabolic activity starts occurring. So what are they? They, For example, when insulin is binding to its receptor, there can be multiple actions. So one of them can be the entry of the potassium, amino acids and the phosphates into the insulin sensitive cells. And this has the management uh, related applied physiology as well. When a person is diabetic, when we want to give, we want to reduce the potassium levels, what we do is if we give the insulin, it will immediately mediate its effect and there will be removal of the potassium from the blood. It will start moving inside the cell. So in the diabetics, in the diabetics, when there is hyperkalemia, if insulin is given along with the glucose, we find that there is increase in the entry of the potassium into the cells. So in a normal physiological state as well, there is entry of potassium amino acids and phosphates into the target cells. Coming to the intermediate actions, so we will be talking about it, but in nutshell, when we have the insulin binding to its receptors, it causes increase in the activity of the cytoplasmic proteins called as the insulin receptor substrates leading to the phosphorylation of multiple enzymes and what is the impact of this? There will be an increased or enhanced glucose transport. There will be increase in the glycolysis activity by the stimulation of their enzymes. There is also stimulation of the glycogen synthesis 
and there is also enhanced protein synthesis by the action of the insulin since it is a, an it is an anabolic hormone and there is decreased gluconeogenesis ultimately all leading to a decrease in the blood glucose level now let's see the long term actions what are the long term actions of insulin insulin does not only get involved in the intermediary metabolism of various substrates but it has multiple long term actions as well so the long term actions of the insulin they are when this insulin receptor uh, leads to the orchestration of various proteins stimulation in the cytoplasm ultimately they will cause the stimulation of the genes within the nucleus for example grb2 activation will lead to this activation of this ras oncogene leading to the stimulation of uh, mitogen activated phosphokinase and there will be gene transcription factors for that causes the phosphorylation and leading to the increase in the messenger rnas and the ultimate action is the lipogenic action which is there it is and many other enzymes which are involved in the differentiation and the anti apoptotic mechanisms they all will be stimulated the effect of the insulin is mediated on skeletal cardiac muscle adipose tissue liver and it also causes the growth and differentiation of the cells so what is the mechanism of action of the insulin hormone it is an anabolic hormone which is also and called as the storage hormone it causes the storage of the nutrients insulin will cause a decrease in the blood glucose level it does so by increased entry of the glucose into the striated cells adipose tissue and the liver and when all the energy requirements of the body are met by the metabolic activity and after the enough amount of the glucose has entered into these cells still if we have excess of the glucose then the energy storage starts occurring in the form of the glycogen and that takes place in the liver and in the skeletal muscle still if we have the extra amount of the glucose entering the cells after the glycogen storage have been overwhelmed then there is conversion of the glucose into other forms of the nutrients or the other forms of the storage that is it promotes the lipogenesis and then it gets stored in the adipose tissue and in this way there is a long term storage of the energy so the action on the target cells is that we see that this insulin hormone comes it binds to its receptor that is located on to the cell membrane of the target organs and we find that in the target cell when insulin binds it binds the to the alpha subunit of its receptor so alpha subunit of the receptor is there and then we have a beta subunit which has a trans we have a cytoplasmic domain which has also a uh, the trans membrane domain and of course it has an exterior component so it will bind the insulin will bind to its alpha subunit that causes the conformational change within the beta subunit and due to this this the cytoplasmic portion of the beta subunit has an inherent tyrosine kinase activity so this binding will cause increase in the tyrosine kinase activity leading to the auto phosphorylation which is also the cross phosphorylation of the beta units and in this way now this receptor insulin complex has become activated now once it has done so now it is capable of causing the phosphorylation of various cytoplasmic proteins like the insulin receptor substrates they also start getting phosphorylated so once these are phosphorylated now insulin receptor substrates there are multiple types of the substrates and the primary one or the chief is irs1 then it will bind with various other cytoplasmic substances like pi3 kinase and it binds with the sh2 domain and in this way now this pi3 kinase will cause the conversion of phosphoenolestol diphosphate to phosphoenolestol triphosphate and this will cause the production of the phosphokinase b and also causing an increase in the inositol triphosphate so this phosphokinase b when which is produced now this is capable of mediating multiple metabolic effects of insulin hormone 
and one of them is that as we have discussed just now glut4 is present in the skeletal muscle cardiac muscle and as well as in the adipose tissue so the glut4 molecules are present within the cytoplasm when insulin comes this glut4 molecule which are present in the cytoplasm they will be activated and they go and they will go to the cell membrane and there they fuse to form these transporter cells and now thereby the glucose will start entering the cells by the facilitated diffusion and this glucose will be utilized for the metabolic activity of the cell the moment it comes inside the cell by the hexokinase enzyme it will be converted into the glucose 6 phosphate in the case of the liver we have another enzyme that is the glucokinase enzyme so this when it is phosphorylated it will keep on move, uh, causing the movement of the glucose from the exterior into the cell so this energy production will occur and when this glycolysis is sufficient to meet the energy requirements of the cell then the excess amount of the glucose which forms will be now stimulated to produce the glycogen so let's revise the steps first step is binding of insulin to the alpha subunit causing a conformational change in the beta subunit leading to the auto phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues within the beta subunit that stimulates the phosphorylation of many intracellular proteins and by and thereafter all these many kinases are activated they mediate the action metabolic action of insulin by enhancing the glucose transportation into the muscles and also causing the activation of the glycogen synthesis so let's briefly discuss what is the effect of the exercise on the insulin action as in the diabetes mellitus management exercise is one of the chief ways in the patient is instructed to go for the exercise and why is it so why is it important for a diabetic to go for the exercises it is so because exercise has an insulin sparing effect and it lowers blood glucose level that is independent of the insulin these insulin sensitive tissues that contain glut4 vesicles that we have just studied now that and they will that move into the cell membrane in response to the exercise that is independent of insulin action that means the exercise when a person is doing it mediates another pathway that is 5- amp activated kinase pathway and that stimulates the movement of the glut4 vesicles from the cytoplasm and they start getting fused into the cell membrane and enhancing the glucose entry so not only the exercise will cause increase in the metabolic activity and thereby reducing the blood glucose level but the main or the chief pathology involved in diabetes is that there is decreased entry of the glucose into the cell so it will enhance the glucose level into the cell and due to which the blood glucose level will start reducing time so what is the importance of storing energy in form of glycogen instead of glucose in liver why the liver has to perform so many metabolic activities just to convert the glucose into the glycogen and it can be stored why it cannot directly store glucose it is so because the osmosis which is a colligative property it depends on the number rather than the size of the particles so when we have millions of glucose molecules coming into the liver if we if we allow it to happen then there will be huge amount of the endosmosis and there will be liver swelling so the body has devised this mechanism that it converts the glucose millions of glucose molecules into very few glycogen molecules that controls this endosmosis into the hepatic cells and they also require lesser space for the storage and we find that the person will be able to store larger amount of the energy without having without going through this process of endosmosis there is also another pathway that is we have just discussed that is grb2 that activates this ras anco uh, ras anco gene and via this map kinase and gene transcription we will have the long term effect of the insulin hormone so this is what happens when the insulin hormone comes and it mediates its effect via this its receptor so phosphokinase b we have just now discussed that it will cause increase in the glucose entry into the cells and also promotes glycogenesis the other two major functions are that it also promotes the protein synthesis and it also causes antilipolysis and due to this we find 
that the person will be able to store all major forms of the metabolic of the uh, the storage forms of energy for example the protein synthesis the glucose being converted to glycogen and fat synthesis which will be stored in the adipose tissue in the long run it promotes the differentiation and anti apoptosis which is also involved in the pubertal growth of the individual so another important physiological concept is that liver how does it function as a glucostatic organ it is so because uh, the liver instead of hexokinase contains the enzyme glucokinase it is a low affinity and high capacity enzyme for glucose binding and it liver also contains another enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase enzyme so when there is hyperglycemia or when the blood glucose level is high say in a condition of postprandial when person has taken the meal so we want that this glucose should start moving into the liver and other organs so within the liver there is presence of this glucokinase which has a very high capacity it will immediately whatever the glucose is coming in via the blood into the liver it will keep on converting it very fast into the glucose 6 phosphate so this phosphorylation will keep this movement of enhanced movement of the glucose coming into the liver and now this glucose will be used for the metabolism for the metabolic activity of the liver whereas on the other side when we want that the glucose should be moved out of the liver that is hepatic glucose output has to be increased liver has another enzyme that is called as glucose 6 phosphatase so glucose 6 phosphatase uh, will what it will do or uh, uh, it will convert this glucose 6 phosphate which is stored into the glucose and in when this glucose is increased there will be the release of the glucose from the liver into the blood and from there it can be utilized by all other organs so the glucose is released in the blood and in this way so glucostatic organ liver can function in both the hypoglycemic state and as well as in the hyperglycemic state and there is a fine balance which is being maintained and uh, because when we we and when we are eating or when we are in the postprandial state we want more and more energy to be synthesized and stored so we will be having the stimulation of the glycogen synthesis and the energy will be stimulated and further increase of the when the glycogen stores are overwhelmed then it will be stored in the form of the fat in the adipose tissue so the glucose enters glucokinase enzyme will convert it into the glucose 6 phosphate now it enters the process of glycolysis whereas various intermediary steps are there converting to fructose 6 phosphate biphosphate phosphonol phosphonol pyruvate pyruvate and then it enters the krebs cycle where the acetyl coa binds with the oxaloacetate and then we find that it is converted to citrate and tricitric acid will give rise to the release of the atps which will be utilized but when there is excess then this glucose 6 phosphate will the, the will be converted to glycogen by the activity of the glycogen synthase and uh, another important mechanism that we will be taking care of just now is that when there is not only it stimulates this glycolysis it also stimulates the pentose phosphate pathway that causes the synthesis of nadp and it is an important constituent that is utilized for the lipogenesis and whenever there is requirement of the glucose in the body especially uh, when there is hypoglycemia or when the metabolic activity is high so there will be another enzyme called as the phosphorylase and it will cause the uh, the degradation of the glycogen and this glucose 6 phosphatase enzyme will cause increased conversion to the glucose and it will be released so when there is hyperglycemia insulin promotes the lipogenesis and inhibits and we find that the overwhelming of the tca cycle has already occurred that means now no more further we can process it through the krebs cycle so the amount of the citrate which is there it spills over into the cytoplasm so this citrate will be acted upon by the enzyme atp citrate lyase and again the citrate gets converted into acetyl coa now this acetyl coa gets converted to malonyl coa uh, 
with by the activity of the enzyme acetyl coa carboxylase now this melonyl coa is a very important intermediary metabolite it will two things can happen this melonyl coa it inhibits the beta oxidation by causing the inhibition of the enzyme carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 enzyme and it also causes the stimulation of the fatty acid synthase that converts it into the fatty acyl coa ultimately what is happening the there is inhibition of the fatty acid metabolism or fatty acid oxidation will be reduced and all the fatty acids and there will be increase in the production of the more amount of the fatty acyl coa that ultimately leads to the synthesis of more amount of the fats so this fatty acyl coa then binds with the dihydroxyacetone phosphate which is one of the intermediary product of the glycolytic cycle and they together will form this triacyl glycerols and these triacyl glycerols then will go via the blood and they will be utilized and they will be stored in the adipose tissue so this try in this way whatever the excess amount of the glucose is there now it is being diverted and being converted into the fat this is the process of the lipogenesis so it stimulates the glycolytic pathway it will stimulate the pantose phosphate pathway it always it will also stimulate the glycogenesis pathway so all the enzymes involved in these pathways will be stimulated and it will inhibit the gluconeogenetic pathway that means those all those enzymes which can cause the increase in the blood glucose level so it will inhibit glucose 6 phosphatase carbolo carboxylase carboxykinase 16 biphosphatase or the phosphorylase so the increase in the production of the glucose from other uh, sources will be reduced so insulin promotes lipogenesis and inhibits the lipolysis in the adipose tissue we have two now major sources of the fat one is that is coming from the diet that will be packaged in the form of the vldl uh, lipoproteins and the one that is now being utilized as we have discussed triacylglycerols they will be packaged in the form of the chylomicrons since now the glycogenolysis has been inhibited by insulin and gluconeogenesis has also been inhibited these chylomicrons will come into the blood and they will be then acted upon by the enzyme called as the lipoprotein lipase insulin acts on to the adipose tissue that stimulates the release of this lipoprotein lipase it will act on to these chylomicrons which are tagged with apoB48 protein and when they identify them these chylomicrons will be degraded within the adipose tissue into the fatty acids so insulin will act on the adipose tissue that will cause increase in the movement of the glut4 molecules on to the surface that will enhance the entry of the glucose we have already seen that how lipoprotein lipase will act to cause an increase in the entry of the fatty acids so this glucose will undergo the glycolysis and that glycerol which is produced dihydroxystone phosphate they both will combine together to give rise to the triacyl glycerols which are stored over here in the long term and this is the form of the energy which can be stored for very large amount of the time simultaneously insulin hormone when it comes into the adipose tissue it also inhibits another important hormone that is the hormone sensitive lipase this enzyme is involved in the catabolism of the tri of these triacyl glycerols so it will be prevented and in this way it will remain within the adipose tissue and there will be increase in the adipose tissue of the body so the in the liver the major metabolic actions are it decreases the ketogenesis it increases protein synthesis lipid synthesis it decreases gluconeogenesis it enhances the glycogen synthesis and it also increases the glycolysis in the adipose tissue it increases the glucose entry into the cell increases the fatty acid synthesis it causes increased glycerol phosphate synthesis triglyceride deposition activation of the lipoprotein lipase and inhibition of the hormone sensitive lipase so the physiologic actions on the liver 
adipose tissue skeletal muscle ultimately they all will orchestrate in such a manner that there is a decrease in the plasma glucose level there is increased storage and utilization of the glucose and there is also increase in the protein synthesis and in the liver there will be first the conversion of the glucose for the metabolic activity then for the glycogen and then it will be diverted for the synthesis of the lipids that are stored in the adipose tissue it will cause an increase of the potassium entry into the cells it will promote the synthesis of dna and rna and therefore it has a positive growth promoting effect on the body and it is an anabolic hormone and it will lead to the increase in the cell differentiation and as well as cell multiplication